literacy tests legal? Yes, yes, the literacy yeah. tests, believe it or not, technically speaking, the literacy tests are still in the Constitution of New York State. They were put in in the 1920s. And we had a constitutional convention in, um, I think, 1965 or six, And I was a member of the constitutional convention. And I moved at the constitutional convention to eliminate the literacy test because I said they discriminated against Puerto Ricans and blacks. So then the Italians stood up and said, you can't do that, these literacy tests you need to have. I said, okay, fellas, you want to listen? 1920, when the literacy test was adopted, I picked up a paper, I read from the proceeding. It said, we have to have a literacy test because there's a new race is coming into New York City who doesn't understand democracy. This dark Mediterranean case race is dangerous and we have to protect ourselves. This dark Mediterranean race that they were talking about was you guys. So I said, uh-oh. So they switched and they voted to eliminate the literacy test. However, <coughs> for other reasons, the Constitution was defeated because of the Blaine Amendment having something to do with religion. So we had to go to Congress to get rid of the literacy test. But we did. A number of us, Rama Santaella, me, and uh, Elena Valentin, we all went to testify, uh, and we talked about what was going on, and our people were being denied the right to uh, uh, register and to vote. Well, from that point on, uh, now that you were you were known in political circles and making a name for yourself, and Kennedy was successful right. uh, in his bid for the presidency. Your career moved very, very fast. Yeah, because the next uh, problem was uh, that Robert F. Weiner was the mayor. And uh, uh, he had been uh, opposed by the regular organization. And he had a very tough fight. Nobody thought that he would win. His opponent was the Sapio, who was Carmine. a well-known, Carmine de Sapio was a well-known uh, city, state, and national leader. So. When he first announced, um, it was on a Friday that he would run for re-election, Wagner was very much alone. Nobody wanted to touch him because they figured he couldn't be re-elected. So I called a friend of mine who was a city council, and I said, I'd like to go and meet with uh, Mayor Wagner with a group of Puerto Ricans. So I got an appointment right away, which never would have happened. Saturday, we met with the mayor. A number of Puerto Ricans, including Johnny Caro and some of the other people who uh, later, Irma Santaella and others. And we told the mayor that we would support him and we were sure he would win. And he was very happy because he had nothing else to do. Nobody else was coming around. Uh, and as the year, uh, days went on, he picked up steam and he was elected. And uh, that's why he was appointed Commissioner of Housing Relocation as the first Hispanic commissioner in the history of New York City. And Johnny Caro was appointed uh, an assistant to the mayor. And Irma Santaella was appointed deputy commissioner of corrections. Mm -hmm. And others got jobs. So that's how not just me, but others, other Puerto Ricans were able to break into the uh, political scene. And actually, she was the first Puerto Rican woman that's lawyer. Right. Yeah, right. Raised yeah. in, born in New York, but raised in Puerto Rico, I understand. Yeah. So. Yeah, but she was the first woman to get appointed yes. to a city post. Yeah. Uh, from there you became, you go on to become Bronx Borough President, and now the Bronx is burning. What was the advice that John Lindsay did not take from you? Well, I have to go back and explain okay. why the Bronx was burning. When I was elected borough president, John Lindsay had been mayor. And I called, Lindsay of course had his problems with the, the subway strike and other things, but then when that went down and settled, I said, I want to meet with you because I have some very important things to tell you. He said, okay, so we set up a meeting with John Lindsay, just he and I. 
I said, look, we have a big problem. Because before we were elected, a project known as, uh, in, went up in, in the in North Bronx, which has 62,000 apartments. And uh, the problem is that those are cooperative apartments. So co Co-op City? Co-op City, Co-op okay. City. That's why it was known as Co-op City. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty is that they're not going to get any blacks and Puerto Ricans going to a co-op because they don't understand co-ops in those days. What you're going to do is you're going to get the Jewish community going into the apartments at Co-op City. And in those days, the Bronx was predominantly Jewish. The Grand Concourse was solidly Jewish. And he said, when the Bronx uh, Co-op City opens and the a percentage of the Jewish community moves into Co-op City. They're going to leave vacant apartments, which are beautiful. The apartments in Co-op City, in the Grand Concourse, are beautiful apartments. They have sunken living rooms. They're made for family living and beautiful all the way. So when Puerto Ricans move into those apartments, they're going to scare the hell out of the Jewish community. And within a few years, the entire Jewish community is going to move away. And the Puerto Ricans and blacks will move into uh, the Grand Concourse. When they do that, they will leave behind apartments in the South Bronx, which are known as the old law apartments. They have uh, no windows in the, you know, railroad, like the railroad flats. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, uh, they're not fireproof. I said, when those apartments become vacant, because uh, nobody else wants to move into them, they're going to burn down because of the fact that um, the landlords, landlords want to get rid of them. So really? it'd be drug dealers will burn them down, or the landlords will burn them down. And then we're going to have a crisis, because the Bronx is going to be burning. That was in 1965, well before the whole thing happened. So John Lindsay looks at me and he says, I can't cope with this anymore. He walked out of the room. I never did anything about it. Yeah. Because he had just gone through the subway strike and other problems. He felt it was too much. He didn't want to get involved. So he didn't touch that at all. Even though I told him, look, I'm a former housing commission. I know how to rebuild the South Bronx. And I can do, do that slowly, beginning at Fordham Road, going down to 138th Street. I didn't get a chance to do that until uh, over 10 years later when I became deputy mayor. But Lindsay did not want to get involved. He, he was not used to living in a crisis. Someone like our current president and uh, did not know how to react to a project like that. Well, that's, that's I'm going to jump a little bit to your uh, becoming uh, the first Puerto Rican congressman because one of the things that I think interests uh, that we know about and interests us quite a bit is your stand on bilingual education while you were a congressman. Well, you can understand why. Yes. Uh, when I went to Congress, they wanted to put me on the Agriculture Committee. Mm -hmm. But I raised hell about that because. Uh, I said, there's no farms in the South Bronx. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I got help from a lot of my fellow congressmen, like uh, Carey, Governor Carey, who later became governor. And uh, I finally went to the, I said, I want to be in the Committee on Education and Labor, because the problems we have in my district have to do with education and labor. So that, I went to that committee, and I began to work towards uh, getting bilingual education approved. That was in 1960, 1971. And the, the, uh, we didn't get to the Bilingual Education Act till 1974. But then a lot of things happened in that year. Uh, first of all, the members of the committee were all opposed to bilingual education because they said, that's a nutty idea. We've had immersion in this country. Why should we have this for uh, Puerto Rican people? And I found out the chairman of the committee was a guy who was from a uh, state way out in the Midwest who came from Norway. So 
So I went up to him, not in the public session. I said, listen, you asked why should we want to uh, keep our language? You know, I was reading about the history of your country, where your parents come from. And there was a time when they were invaded by Germany, and they insisted on keeping their language. What's wrong with our doing it? He says, well, you, you have a point. He still wasn't convinced, but at least he did not oppose me as strongly as he had before. And uh, then I worked with some of the uh, other people, and I got Senator Kennedy to support the bill in the other house. And because Kennedy, you remember that I, I met him during the Kennedy right. campaign, right. and I always worked very closely with right. him. And he was very influential, so he was able to carry the bill in the Senate. Uh, while I was struggling with it in the House. And uh, it was a big struggle because, as I said, the opposition was very violent. But what happened was we had great luck in the year 1974. The case that I mentioned earlier, Lau against Nichols, which uh, said you cannot just teach in English, was uh, came down from the United States Supreme Court. The Aspira Consent Decree, which says a paralysis, had been working on, came down in 1974. Yeah. And so, pointing to those things, I was able to get uh, more support for bilingual education because I said, look fellows, the United States Supreme Court has ruled that we need to do something. And I said, I've been through this, I told them something about my stories, and uh, it's not going to get any better unless we change it. Because it's true that when the people, the the, uh, the Italians and the other groups came to uh, New York City in 1900 and so. They did not, they had to only could speak English. And they, the problem is they dropped out of high school. Right. But in those days, everybody dropped out of high school. Only 3% of the population graduated from high school. And there were plenty of jobs in factories and elsewhere. Today, in the 20th century, you need to have at least a high school diploma. So it's a different world, and we have to adjust our policies to fit the different world. And that got me some support. And so I was able to work out a very complicated formula, which, uh, by studying the rules of the House, it says, if you introduce a bill and be in the House floor, and before it's voted upon, you withdraw it, and I knew it was going to be defeated with voter power. Then if you get it approved in the Senate and it comes back for the conference committee, then they can approve the bill. So I talked to Senator Kennedy, and that's the way we worked it out, and that's how we got approved. That was a very, very important time, your support of bilingual education and all the work that you were doing. I mean, we, in our archives, we have so many photographs and images of you and uh, Evelina. Antonetti yes. and the yeah. other people that were for. Uh, why did you say, be careful what you wish for? Oh, because when I got bilingual education approved, we had thought, when we got it approved, that at most you need to, you, ha you have a, a, what we call transitional bilingual education. You start off 100% Spanish, then you go to 90, 10, 80, 20, and so forth. But I didn't want to tell the uh, educational system <coughs> how long the process should be, because I felt, you know, that's going too far. We impose bilingual education on, on the educational system, but then to go and tell the teachers you can only do this for a certain number of years, that's wrong. That's up to them. So we left it alone. But our, I thought that it would only be about two to three years. But then we discovered years later that in, for example, in Brooklyn, they were having bilingual education for up to eight years. And that's, that's terrible because a kid spends eight years in bilingual education learning in Spanish, you're never going to be able. So that's why I say be careful what you wish for. Because then the people, you know, began to dig in. They didn't want to cut it down because they had made a career of being uh, bilingual education teachers. And then remember I had the same problem with Austin's Community College. I had been the one who got Austin's Community College approved at the Board of Estimate when I was borough president. And it was the first bilingual college 
in the history of the, of the state. Then we found out later on that at Astos, they were giving diplomas to kids who could not speak English. And in fact, there were some teachers who would say at Astos, aquí no se habla inglés, even though it's supposed to be professors, even though it's supposed to be uh, a college. And so got rid of the, uh, the president of the college, and uh, we changed that, I hope. Uh, but there's been a struggle all the time between those who want to keep bilingual education going on and on and on. Uh, in fact, some members of the State Assembly today <coughs> believe that bilingual, the purpose of bilingual education is to teach the students Spanish. Whereas, in fact, the purpose of bilingual education is to teach them English. And there's a whole crowd of people who are committed to the Spanish language. And they, they know they're not helping the kids, but they don't care. That is their attitude. And that's why I say, be careful what you wish you for, because you, don't, you can't control them, uh, even if you bring out that they're doing the wrong thing. Herman, we could, I mean, we've only scratched the top of the surface, but I want to open it up to of course, yeah. uh, discussion from the, from the floor and uh, allow you to. Clara Rodriguez. Yeah. You know what, just identify yourself very quickly. Uh, Clara Rodriguez from Florida. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question about uh, your time as the Housing Relocation uh, Commissioner. Um, and and to what extent you were involved in the um, Lincoln Center redevelopment? Because there was a lot of relocation. No, I was. I came after Lincoln Center oh. because uh, uh, Mayor Wagner felt that the policies of Robert Moses were not good at all because Moses were doing things that destroy neighborhoods, primarily Puerto Rican neighborhoods. For example. <coughs> came up with the Cross Bronx Expressway, which broke the Bronx in half. And Lincoln Center, he displaced people. But we had the, uh, the biggest controversy with Moses was the uh, Lower Manhattan Expressway. Because he wanted to have, see Moses only cared, and I knew Moses, he only cared about the automobiles. So he wanted the uh, Cross Bronx Expressway to um, uh, bring in Rock's Neck and Whitestone Bridge to George Washington Bridge. He wanted the Lower Manhattan Expressway to cover um, the Brooklyn Bridge and Manhattan Bridge to the uh, Holland Tunnel. But that would have destroyed all of Chinatown and the whole Hispanic community and divided um, Manhattan again in half. And we had a very contentious uh, meeting of the Board of Esther I w as, a, as a relocation committee, committee uh, uh, chairman, I was against it. I went by Moses, met with me many times, trying to persuade me, but uh, I wasn't buying. And we had a hearing at the Board of Estimate that went from 10 in the morning to 3 in the morning the following day. And Wagner was always, we didn't know what Wagner was going to do, but finally he came down and against the Lord Manhattan Expressway. And that was a real blow that ended the career of uh, Robert Moses. And generally, in the relocation activities, for example, the uh, West Side Urban Renewal Project, which was a project from 87th Street to 97th Street, Central Park West to Amsterdam, um, had been going on for over five years when I became uh, borough president and uh, became commissioner, housing commissioner. So the mayor told me to look into it because he said, if we don't do something about that, we're not going to get the federal money. So I, we had meeting after meeting after meeting, uh, the chairman of the Housing Executive Committee, Milton Muller and I, <coughs> would go and meet with the West Side people. And if you know anything about the West Side reformers, they go on till three in the morning too. Uh, so we argued with them over and over. And finally I uh, told the mayor, i got to see you about the West Side. So I went to see him, and uh, Wagner was the kind of guy who always had ten meetings going on at a time. And I went there at Gracie Mansion, and the main room was busy 
The other room was busy. Went upstairs, that was busy. The only place we could find was the bedroom, we, where you didn't have a meeting going on. Sometimes people would wait for hours till he finished whatever meeting that was. That was part of his personality. And that's why he settled all labor problems. He never had a strike, because he would wear the people out. They can sit in Gracie Mansion for days till they talking to each other till they finally agree. So I said, look, you other commissioners have said that they are only going to have, this is a district that is heavily Puerto Rican and black, <coughs> low-income people. And what they want to do is they want to have, uh, if you want to get the project approved, you have to increase the uh, number of low-income apartments to 2,400. So he said, well, if you can do it without going back to Washington, I'll go along. So we had meeting after meeting, and we came up with a proposal, which was then unique, but which is now very prevalent. And that was <coughs> to, within the same building, have 80% middle-income people and 20% low-income people. And at that time, people said, you can't do that because middle-income people are never going to agree to live in the same building with low-income people. Don't worry, you'll see. They did. And that now people, 80-20 is, anyone who knows anything about housing knows about 80-20, and uh, they think it's a law. They don't understand. This was invented by us. And, but that settled the West Side Urban Renewal, and it was built, and now it's a beautiful uh, development, which is important because the idea of the West Side Urban Renewal Project was that if you rebuild the area from 87th Street to 97th Street, then private enterprise would build the area above 97th Street and below 87th Street. And that's what happened. So in effect, that saved the uh, west side of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. David, yeah. The late 60s and the schools was a very difficult time when you were borough president and Lindsay, uh, Mayor Lindsay was yeah, there, there with some uh, Supreme Court decisions about uh, mandating desegregation in the north. There was a community control. It seems like that's also the time when people decided that the public school system wasn't uh, salvageable. What was going on in that time from your perspective? Well, the problem there was, we had, talking about the Ocean Hill-Brownsville project problem, which was made up primarily of black leaders. And they came to the conclusion that the existing system was not going to help the black people to move up. And so they decided to appoint their own superintendent, and that's what there was there, and to bring in their own teachers, which led Al Shanker to have a citywide strike, which lasted quite a long time. And they said, we want community control. And they said to Lindsay, you agreed to community control. And Lindsay said, no, I never agreed to that. And they kept talking about it. The problem was, that Lindsay never understood the difference between community control and community approval. Because community control means that, and this is what the black leaders kept telling them over and over, and he never got it. We want control of the district. And Lindsay said, you know, I don't understand why you have a problem when I'm talking to you a lot. And there's a different community control means you don't control it, you make recommendations. And therefore, they never came to an agreement and uh, took a long time. But eventually, the uh, community leaders lost. And uh, that's why uh, Shanka won. And that set back the whole idea of improving the educational system for quite a long period of time. And Shanka was the head of the, he was the, head teachers, of the teachers' union. union. Yeah. And the, uh, uh, one of the main persons from the uh, Ocean Hill Brownsville was uh, Brody McCoy. Yeah. yeah who comes, who yeah. made a name for himself at that point in terms of education. Uh, say something. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a, a broader question because I think when we think about the number of the year, we think about a figure that was very, very important to the Puerto Rican community and the development of the Puerto Rican community. But uh, he's, uh, he's two people from the perspective of many. Uh, I knew you uh, as
as a liberal progressive, some would say a, a politician activist who uh, was very strong anti-war very early when other politicians were afraid to speak out against the war in Vietnam. And you've spoken about your positions on voting rights, on bilingual education, etc. Yet when I talk to, uh, to young people, uh, they see Imam Badejo as a Republican conservative. Uh, when you think about that, uh, how would you describe yourself today politically? Uh, and how do you think you will be remembered uh, in a historical sense when we look at the community as developed? Well, I'm still, I sort of still feel the same way. I'm against the war in Afghanistan, and uh, I am not, uh, I am for the same things, as I've said here, for bilingual education, and for all the things that I was for, because being a Republican in New York City is like being a left-winger in the rest of the country. You know, there's, there's really no such thing in the city of New York. Um, I joined the Republican Party because I was working with Rudy Giuliani, and I worked with him in doing some important things in education. I was the special counsel for the uh, fiscal oversight of education because the whole educational system was a mess then. I don't have time to go into the details of that, but we got rid of a number of, uh, of chancellors. And I was pushing them to get rid of social promotion and tracking. And so in order to get the necessary support from City Hall, that was one of the things I did. Um, unfortunately, we still have social promotion, and we still have tracking, and I'm still fighting the same battles, uh, because the uh, educational system is the most important institution in the nation, and it's also the institution that does the most to maintain the status quo and to maintain racism and to enable people, not to enable people to get an education. Because, no, but where, where would you put yourself, aside from education, that you were... No, on everything. I just said the, uh, I was against the Vietnam War, against the war in Afghanistan. I'm for gay rights. I'm for all of the things that uh, the Democrats, uh, that I did, always did as a Democrat. No, no philosophical change. Well, a good example is uh, that you were one of the prime movers in establishing the SEEK program. That's right. In the City would. University yeah. and the uh, uh, Discovery uh, Opportunity Program. Yeah, well, some people attacked me because uh, I was uh, against open admissions. But you were against open admissions? And I was, but they don't realize I was against open admissions from the beginning. Open admissions came into effect mm -hmm. when Lindsay was mayor. What happened was some kids rioted in City College. And Lindsay was terrified of riots because there were riots going on all over the country. So um, we talked to Bowker, and, uh, who was then the chancellor, and they agreed to set up open admissions. And I was the only public official who opposed open admissions at City College. And I said, City University is known as the Harvard of the poor. If you have open admissions, you're going to make it into a second-rate high school, and the city university is going to be destroyed. And that's what happened. Um, after a while, the diploma from the city university didn't mean anything. I met with many business leaders. They told me, look at the back of the diploma. If it's before <coughs> 1969, we just don't pay any attention to it. So I decided to get rid of open admissions, and then I found out the problem at Austin's Community College, and then I found out as a member of the board and then chairman that the same problem existed at many of the other colleges. And I thought this was outrageous because we go to meetings of the board of directors of the city university and all the college presidents are present. And they heard me arguing with the president of Austin's Community College about what they were doing, and they were doing the same thing, and nobody said a word during all of the discussions that went on for over a year, and I was picketed at the home, picketed at the office, and picketed at the Board of Education. None of them said anything. 
but I got it approved. What they said was, when they were opposing it, was that if I got open admissions removed, you would not be able to get Hispanics and blacks admitted because they cannot meet the standards. I said, Baloney, we can meet the standards of anybody else. And, uh, and I got it approved, and it turns out now we have more Hispanics and blacks at uni and more uh, of the other groups than ever before. And it shows that if you raise standards, you will be, uh, the people, the individuals involved will be able to meet them. And that's why I say that social promotion is wrong. We have to have standards. If you do your work, you pass. If you don't do your work, you fail. And you get remedial assistance. Because if you have standards, you will find that more of the students are going to meet them and move along. And I said, if you don't think that what I'm saying is true, look at the city universities. So I proved that I could do that. And I'm still trying to do it K-12. But uh, I have not been able to make much progress with Bloomberg or with, uh, or with Klein. I'm sure I will not make any progress with, with the new chancellor. So. Herman, we want to thank you okay, for, thank you. for being with us this afternoon. Welcome. And this is to be continued. Yeah, a lot of the issues that came up from the audience are issues that we would like to explore okay. in greater detail. Mm -hmm. I'll think future. of some more issues for the next time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you.